Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to School Psych Podcast. I'm really excited tonight. Always excited when we have Dr. Vander Hayden on. It's going to be a fun time. Um, you know, we have kind of a little bit of a, a free-flowing agenda tonight, so feel free to, you know, put your questions and comments in the chat, um, and, that, and that'll be great. Um, but my name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist in Maryland. I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who's going to talk uh, about how to participate tonight if you're watching live. Rebecca. Hi, everybody. I really hope that you are watching live, uh, tuning in tonight to your YouTube account. And if you are, please comment right alongside the chat. If you log into your account, you can comment there. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment that you'd like to be slightly more private, you can message us on the School Psych uh, Podcast Facebook page or... I don't know why I can't speak. I'm just a little tired. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> or on schools on uh, school psych, your school psychologist. No, that is not my Facebook page. It's school psych, your school psychologist. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> message me, DM me, tell me how I get over my uh, travel tiredness. I just uh, spent some time on planes this weekend visiting my son. So I'm really sorry. And also you can um, tweet at us. Uh, I think it's still what it's called on X slash Twitter using the hashtag psyched podcast. And I'll be looking for notifications. So please join us um, anytime. Even if you're not watching live, join us later. Feel free to comment. The comments get synced up in to the video in real in the time that the um, the discussion is happening. So we'll look for that. And um, now I'm going to hand it off to Eric who's going to introduce himself and our wonderful guest. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, we are excited to have Dr. Amanda Van Amanda Vander Hayden back again uh, as a recurring guest. We are um, fans, groupies uh, of hers and her work, and and a uh, number of colleagues that we all share in common. So uh, it's exciting for us to have her here. And uh, just a little bit about her: if you have not met her yet and uh, haven't listened to some of the previous podcasts that she's been on. Uh, um, Dr. Vander Hayden is a school psychologist and also has been a professor and is an author um, and is the author of Spring Math, which is a fantastic program. And um, hopefully we'll talk more about Spring Math tonight. We may talk about her upcoming NAS presentation and just all things math um, and all things school psych, I guess. Uh, but she's a fantastic um, person and author. One of my favorite books in the field is the RTI method for uh, identifying learning disabilities, which she co-wrote. Um, and it's just been uh, second edition just came out this past year. And if you are a school psychologist who's looking to clean up your SLD identification process, um, that is the book for you. Really, uh, it's one of my favorites. I have uh, bought several copies and given them away. I've dog-eared the pages and my copies have sticky notes in them and notes in the margins. And um, really, it's, it's a fantastic book for understanding the exclusionary criteria and learning to gather data to rule out or rule in a learning disability using a scientific method. And so it's really what we should be doing as school psychologists, regardless of whether your state requires the um, discrepancy model or a PSW approach or RTI, you still have to address the exclusionary and inclusionary criteria and you need data to do it. So, um, oh my gosh, so I, I really love so that. Much it's just so much work. There's no way around it. The whole book is how to do RTI, really, because at the end, putting the pieces together to make the formal decisions, not that big a deal. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. You just need to have all that, all the work. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. How many years have yep. you guys been doing this wonderful podcast? Wow. I think it was 2014 when we started. Wow. If not well, 20 sir. years. <laughs> A long time. We're on episode 168 tonight. So. That's just amazing. And I love it. I think you guys are just a gift to the, you know, I feel that way about you. I love, I'm a, it's a mutual fan club. I love your work. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, Rebecca and Rachel and I have all been like chatting and messaging this week about what should we talk to Dr. Vander Hayden about? And um, we have lots of things, you know, uh, right. one of the things that I'm noticing is 
similar to the reading curricula wars that have been going on, we're starting to have sort of math curricula wars. And I see on social media mm -hmm. arguments about, um, you know, should we continue doing, you know, memorization and, um, and speed, you know, speed drills and, and um, fluency drills and those kinds of things. No, we shouldn't. Yes, we should. And, and people are getting sort of mired in the, the minutia of all of that. And I, I wonder if you have thoughts, if you've seen some of that and, and what's uh -oh. your thoughts uh -huh. I've been in the middle of it. Are you kidding me? It's exhausting. I can't, it's just, it's this, okay, actually, who was I? I was talking to somebody yesterday. Oh, I, I know who it was. I, she has a podcast too. It's a really good one. Um, do you know Anna Stocky? Do you know that name? She is a math professor in Canada who became, we, we were on a panel together for a presentation in Portugal and I had never met her and I followed her and I was just like so caught up in her presentation. I forgot to even be nervous that I was about to speak, which is always really cool. And, um, but she just got fired up because she was seeing all these kids arrive at college, math majors who couldn't do basic algebra. And she kind of like began to work with them and discovered they really didn't understand you know, the fundamental single digit operations. Right. And so she got really fired up about that. And then she began to kind of look into and she had her own children going through school at that time. And she began to look at well, what they were bringing home for homework and what the expectations were and the way they were being taught and all the things were coming up, productive struggle and inquiry based learning and all of that. And she just got fired up and said, this is bad for kids. It's bad for my kids. No wonder they're arriving at college and they, they are not prepared to be trained to work in a STEM profession, let alone probably, you know, you got to be able to do basic math in most professional work. Um, so she began to work and try to advocate for different practices and she's done remarkable work but she has this podcast called chalk and talk and several of us have done a tour on that and i i was recommending to her somebody that she might have on one of our mutual friends and um so we were talking about it's the same science that drives the science of reading and the science of math now there are some reading specific studies, okay? But for me, it's a behavioral science. And for some people, it's a cognitive science. And that underlying science is the same, right? So I even, I said that to her. I said, first of all, it's the same science. And oh, by the way, many of us are the same people. And if we're not, we know each other extremely well. So what I'm running into, which is my new irritation, is people who promote practices in math that really have not been demonstrated to be effective. And these are not people who are willing to talk about ways maybe to make those practices be more effective and consistent with science. Um, they will say, well, this is very, science of math is different from the science of reading. The science of reading was right. Well, they were only saying that because the science of reading has more traction now. OK, and that's why it makes me say, well, but you realize it's the same science and and definitely, by the way, we are many of us are the same people. I've published a lot in reading research. I just don't like to work in that space anymore. I really I'm, I don't I rather work in math. I think it's much more needed, um, but it's so interesting to me. It, it is totally a repeat of the reading wars, all the same problems. Right. Math curricula. None of those are the place to go to solve your math problem. They all have a relatively weak effect on student achievement. Um, it's so interesting. And we say we've been saying these things for a decade. Easy. We've been saying these things for a decade and, and it is just the same old thing. So probably 30 years before people will begin to get mad and say, wow, this really was not good for my own child. I think parents may may just like it happened with the science of reading. It might be the parents who turn the tide. I hope so. I hope so too. And I wanted to comment because what your friend is observing in college students, math majors, is very similar to what's happening to me as a school psychologist back in graduate school. I should really understand and be able to apply statistical thinking at a much higher level, given that I've been a school psychologist for 11 years, but I'm really embarrassed and also, you know, 
need to say that it's still hard. Like, and you know, Amanda, because I reach out to you in a panic regularly um help me with spss and what did, you, what did you call your math your your statistics disability <laughs> which is not real but yeah, it's it might be i don't know maybe that could be my dissertation but uh <laughs> I, it's some kind of um i the, the last one i thought of was mathanesia because i learn it and i learn yeah. it for the test and then it's gone mathanesia yeah. Cognitive recall deficiency, I think, is what I want to call it. But um, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> but also, as a parent, and then thinking about my own math growing up, like what I got from math, and sort of the parallel tracks between inconsistent um, availability for even the math education that I was receiving, and also math anxiety, which in a future episode, we're going to have Robin Cotting on to talk She's about. She's the one. Yes. Yeah. Something that she um, recently published a meta-analysis that said, yeah. treating math anxiety can, is separate from treating sort of math skills with right. with this, yes. with evidence-based uh, instruction. Yes. Um, but also raising my kids. I remember when, and they're young adults in their 20s now, when they started kindergarten, the schools in my area had a big shift from from um, like tell me the answer to show me how you're thinking, right? And and then they shifted again to um, sort of an Asian version of math. I forget what they called it, but yeah. they discovered that um, China and other Asian countries that were like just excelling in mathematics far faster than we were. And so we were going to do it just like them, which was a right. lot of, um, I think more speed times tests and drilling and things, but then that didn't work out for the school where my children were. And then they switched back to something that was I like, mean, how familiar is this? So <laughs> did you, what's his name? George, uh, Sugai. Remember George Sugai? You ever, did you ever get to see him speak? I don't know if he speaks a lot anymore, but did you ever get, he's a great speaker. And I remember watching him speak in um, Baton Rouge one time, Joe Witt had him down and he said, you know, there's this natural adoption cycle and, and right about the time it's at the peak of when people are hot for it and saying we're implementing it, half of the people are not implementing it. So it's not working. And as it's dying away, the new thing is coming in to replace it. And I see this and you know, we've all seen this in schools. And that's one of the ways like this is really poor leadership because people they they start to adults start to get anxious, like, oh, what if this doesn't work? So they keep changing horses. And every time you change horses, you also get to avoid accountability. So think about how naturally this happens with um, superintendents. Superintendents rarely stay long enough to see if the policies that they enacted actually produce benefit to the very children they claimed that they would. So what they get evaluated on and what they get the next job on is typically not the results that they've just gotten because they don't have enough time. But instead, it's what kind of splash did they get in the media? Right. Did they in, buy a bunch of computers and it got, you know, made the news and people felt good. And that's what gets them the next job, which is really a shame because the number one job to me of any um, school leader is to be a steward and it, to be the first, the number one instructional leader of the school. Right. They should be able and comfortable to step in and teach a math class. And we have to we have to expect our leaders to not continue these myths about well, I'm not a math person. I guess I promise you, you can teach children how to add and subtract. You really can. It's not that challenging of a, of a concept. But to your point, you probably had a lot of kind of things stacked against you in terms of crummy instruction yourself. Uh, the curricula are just over many decades. There's a there. It's not one or two studies. It's a body of evidence that really indicts the quality of math curricula on a number of fronts. I'm thinking of an old Asha Jatendra study. I think it was published in 2005, where she reported some crazy number of errors in worked examples in textbooks. Then combine that with teachers in the lower grades in math 
often teach at the lower grades because they're passionate and they love to teach reading. And then look at the ways in which systems support reading instruction. They get the preferred time of the day. They get the professional development. They get the allocation of resources to support reading development has outpaced the allocation of resources to support math development. And then everybody's surprised when these children hit eighth grade and suddenly everybody's in a panic that they can't do math. But it was actually a predictable outcome. Crummy curricula delivered with the least resource allocation possible. So, you know, how many times have you asked, well, how many minutes do you have for math instruction? And it's like 40 minutes. Like, that's not enough for. And, and the thing is, too, like a lot, a lot of teachers of younger students even with the, if they say they've got allocated 40 minutes, if they run out of scripted activities to do in 40 minutes, they go back to teaching reading or they're teaching something else because they don't they're not comfortable. And then they sort of we all buy into this kind of like I'm not a math person. Right. And I am so happy you're having Robin on. I know you've had her on before and she's one of my favorites, but she is to me the go to person on math anxiety right now. And so, I mean, I've been saying that to anybody who will hear it. Um, there's a dynamite webinar that she did for us. I would love to send you the link if you want. Um, and it's just a good summary. And we should have her do it again this year because she'll update it. But I have heard Robin present and talk about this. Of course, I've talked with her a lot about this for, for several years. And I hear her now becoming more confident. Like, I don't want to steal her thunder since she's coming on, but becoming more confident because we've, we've known for a long time that math, anxiety and skill proficiency and math are it's a bi-directional feed. Right. But Robin, I hear her now sort of saying, yeah, it's starting to look like there's some consensus that poor skill proficiency precedes the initial onset of math anxiety, which then is fed in a bi-directional way. Um, and, and the great thing about, you know, for years, for the last few years, the other side says, well, you know, timed assessment causes anxiety and a lot of things that really are not supported by science. And what it has, the good that has been caused by that is it's caused people to plan and run wonderful studies, randomized control trials, experimentally evaluating that claim, which really consistently the data are showing, no, timed assessment does not cause anxiety. And if you are a teacher or let's see your school psychologist and you have a teacher saying, I can't do these specific activities with this child because it causes the child to have anxiety, then we need to be able to tell the story of, well, first of all, there is no anxiety treatment on the planet that's effective that doesn't involve exposure. And if you withhold tactics like timed practice activities in the name of avoiding making a child anxious, you'll worsen skill performance, which will in turn worsen anxiety. And like, you just got to get parents and teachers to take a breath. By the way, anxiety is contagious. We know teachers sometimes are anxious about it. Like take a breath and like, let's logically look at this because you certainly don't want to make it worse. And you might think you are helping, but if you just say, all right, you get to escape doing this work and this challenging math work, you don't actually fix an anxiety problem. You make it much worse. I'm dealing with, with, I'm seeing that in my schools, you know, exactly what you're in. In fact, uh, you know, we have some kids that have kind of math fluency work in an IEP goal. And then like the math department saw that and we, you know, the special ed teachers are told, no, you can't time them. It causes anxiety. There's no research behind time. There's not one study that has ever <laughs> shown that, Rachel. Did you know that? No, yeah, I, mean, I, sure you know that. I read it on the scienceofmath.com, which is another thing that I wanted to chat, you know, and where, where that is all going. But yeah, I, and I, you've talked before about, you know, data isn't going to change some minds of some people that, that yeah really that's a john haas quote you can't bring data to a faith fight mm -hmm. i love that quote and it's so true because in many ways i have spent my entire career bringing data to a faith fight and i guess i don't want to say it's been a total fail because in the when i started in this field like people didn't believe you could time kids reading you know i we got kicked out of a, a kindergarten center because we did oral reading fluency with kids 
Well, actually, we were doing some of the double subtests in the in the early days. And um, this is down in Louisiana. And the principal was out that day. And when she got back and a teacher complained that we had timed kids, we had her permission to do the work. She just didn't realize we were timing kids. Um, and when teachers were upset about that, she became upset about that. So this is not new territory. Like we, we actually went through this in reading, too. Back then, what they said was, oh, you have to have running record, right? And you, untimed reading samples that are, you know, you drop down a level and do another and blah, blah. We all know now that's not useful, that you cannot make valid decisions about what kids need based on those data. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy and it drives me nuts because I, I've been so worried about reading for so long and I'm seeing changes now in my school and I'm seeing like, you know, on the horizon, new curriculums coming that, that are a lot better than what we've been doing. And so now I'm kind of like shifting my, my attention to math a little bit more. Yeah. And it's really kind of scary the things that that I'm seeing exactly. And, and that just, you know, when I'm like, oh, but they're. There is research that, you know, timing like it has use and is helpful and can give you practice and that there's no. And, you know, so I can send them these studies, but it's just like, you know, again, they they're it's not data to a faith fight. Right. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. And I often think about that. Like, What is it about these myths in math that resonate so heavily with certain people? And um, and I, as you, I mean, you know, we're on Twitter a lot. And I do engage with, I think it's important to have professional, uh, respectful as much as possible. It's hard within the limits of a tweet to talk to the other side. And I do, I, I feel okay about some of the folks, like it's not personal and it's important to have the conversation, but it can also just, some people are just, it's like road rage on social media. Like, I mean, sometimes I'll get a response, like some guy who I was kind of answering about something and I sent him an article and he said, oh, it's behind a paywall. I can't read it. And I said, well, here's a, you know, it's, and then he misunderstood. He didn't understand single subject design research. So he's like, you know, it only had one subject. I'm like, well, then you don't understand. That's an, actually, it's much harder to run a really well done single subject design than it is to run a group RCT. And I've done both a lot. And um, and I was sort of like, how do you not know that if you're talking about what the research says? You've never even heard of this whole methodology, but OK. And anyway, just very quickly, I didn't say any of that. I felt it. Maybe he read my energy over Twitter, but but the response was so combative and so ugly. And I just thought, like, you're a person who is training teachers who work with children and the way you are behaving in social media is so inappropriate, right? He just, it's just sarcastic and ugly and really disrespectful. And I just don't, I feel like everything in me says don't engage, just stay out. I don't want to give my energy to that, but I make myself do it anyway. And I always figure, you know what? I'm not talking to him. I'm talking to all the people who follow him. And, and you just have to sort of Get back in there and take the high road and put the put the information out. I mean, I know it is data to a faith fight, but sometimes you just something will click. People will ask more questions and become, you know, a little pebble thrown into a lake can become a wave. Right. That's what happened with science of reading. And there are some good journalists who are writing great pieces. I mean, it seems to me all these math pieces that are being written I'm very pleased that they are very consistent about representing the science. And I think they do a nice job of it. In, uh, in reading, I've seen uh, organizations like the Reading League. There's a lot of you know, nonprofits popping up in, in, within my state that <laughs> seek to do reading curriculum advocacy. Um, I know you're involved with uh, the web page, The Science of Math, um, and I love all their infographics and I pull those <laughs> frequently to try and, you know, um, you know, use those. Um, do you see groups like that popping up? Uh, do you think that that is helpful? Is that where it needs to go? I mean, you mentioned like parents yeah. and things like that. Um, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, as much as possible, we want other people to... Right. I mean, when we when we originally began to put together the science of math, the idea was just to provide good resources and, you know, a lot of 
pe and people were involved in, and are involved in that effort. Um, Sarah Powell, um, Corey Peltier, uh, Elizabeth Hughes, myself, Matt Burns, Robin Cotting. Um, there's all you can look on the on the website. There's there's lots of us, and we all sort of contributed volunteer time to put these resources out, and also to sort of vet the resources in, internally and really ask: Did we did we really give this a fair representation? Are we missing some data? And and it's funny because a lot of the critiques we know it's a little provocative to have called it the science of math and. We shamelessly were trying to say, well, we're really saying it is the same underlying science because it is for me in my world. I'm a behavior analyst. So it is the same science that I subscribe to. And I can trace it, you know, very clearly. Curriculum based measurement comes from behavioral science. And anyway, to me, it's just remarkable that people want to say that that science is valid for reading, but not for math, right? It's valid for learning. It doesn't matter what you're learning. <laughs> right? We just need measures of the content and we need to have different benchmarks to reflect mastery of that content. But learning is learning. It doesn't matter if you're learning to play a violin, conduct a surgery, speak a foreign language, or solve a math problem or read a book. It's the same process for the most part. So um, I know the purists might take exception with that, but, um, but really I believe that there is I, and I think it's important because many people could have sort of this initiative fatigue in schools and they could sort of check out and just go, oh, my gosh, it's another movement that I got to understand. And it's really not like there really is a coherent underlying body of science about how humans learn, whether you are a cognitive person, psychologist or you're a uh, more of a behavioral psychologist like I am. Um, but my point is, you know, it is really, if you understand that science, then you can translate it to reading, to writing, to math, to whatever, you know, s social studies, whatever you, you want to work on. Um, truly like alternative, training up alternative adaptive behaviors in the space of you know, behavior management with with psychologists. So um, anyway, I just think that that people can get initiative fatigue and this sort of change fatigue because they don't recognize it's not a whole new set of understandings that you have to master. Right. We in education, we just kind of lose patience with things and then we give it a new name. We do that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of a comment here in the chat that um, some of the publishers of these curricula, you know, they say this, our product is the one, this, this is the answer to your, you know, instructional problems in math. And um, schools can be really drawn into that sometimes. And when, when your school spends their budget on a certain curricula, as a teacher, you may have less flexibility then in what you do going forward and and maybe as the as our viewer says it can create an inconsistency in approaches to teaching oh it's a huge problem in math it is a huge problem in math i mean this happened in my own kids school when they were still at that age where you know they adopted a new curriculum and literally parents were told do not hire tutors for your children because if they fail we we need to see them fail so we can then say that this curriculum is not working and make a difference <laughs> can you imagine saying this to parents i was on the school board at this school i almost lost my mind <laughs> so like this is not the way you do this and then what they chose of course was sort of the soup du jour. I mean, it's the popular kind of like productive struggle, inquiry based learning. I actually get kind of fired up about this. This is not benign. I don't believe that teachers and school leaders have a right to just do what they like or what they're familiar with or what they heard about at a conference. That's that's not OK. We have a responsibility to do what has been shown to be effective so that we know we're not just sending kids out when they graduate from high school without the basic proficiencies, proficiencies that they need to be able to 
have the careers and the lives of their choosing. Um, now, the way I feel about it, and the truth is, if we could be just more committed to doing the things that we know work, you could probably do it so efficiently that there would be plenty of time to monkey around with experimental things that you want to play with and try. But we do it the other way. We start with, well, we think this is a good idea. So we're going to just like flip the script and we're going to introduce a new concept. But as a teacher, I'm not actually going to teach it to you because I want you to work with your partners and wrestle around and use the math. You already know how to do. This is my guidance to you as a new learner who's never been taught how to do this thing. Use the math that you already know how to do to figure out how to do long division. OK, that's not OK. And, and even if it were effective, which it's not, OK, the kids who have success under that model are kids who were kind of instruction proof anyway. They already knew how to do it. They were going to figure out how to do it. They have somebody at home who will help them. But even if it were effective and it's not, but if it were, it's inefficient. So I don't I don't I really kind of would just love to say, all right, I don't care. You can be right and I can be wrong, but let's do it this way. OK. And we'll call it your idea. But and I'm OK with that. But like if you could just do a little a little bit of explicit instruction and some worked models and some guided practice with a gradual release of support, and then you could layer in some fluency building. And if you have time and you want to make it very game like and orchestrate that every single day, fantastic. Give me 30 minutes of your math lesson and I will raise your math scores. That's it. I mean, you know, that in a, in a way, that is why I'm so passionate about this work, because, as you know, I started doing class wide math intervention and really in earnest, you know, district wide and a district in 2002. And we took that little district from middle of the pack in the state to rank order position one. And in the first year, we cut their L SLD rate. We were doing RTI for all reading and math and writing. Um, but they had never done it. When I arrived, they had never heard of curriculum based measurement. Nothing was in place. This was 2002. And they went they went from six percent of their population being um, eligible for SLD to three and a half percent in the first year and took their position as a district from middle of the pack to rank order position one in the state in math achievement. And they stayed there ever since. And I got to tell you, the lesson to me, I mean, I'm a brand new baby school psychologist. I look like I'm 12. You know, I wasn't. I was 30, but I look like I was 12. And and I remember saying that was too easy. <laughs> Something is terribly wrong because I was I didn't expect it to be that effective. And then, of course, the next 20 years of my life for almost 30 years has been, you know, not 30 since I was 30, but 30 since I was 20 um, has been developing and trying to get more leverage from class wide math intervention. And it is not fancy. It's not some groundbreaking rocket science kind of approach. It is practice at the right level of difficulty with well-controlled materials and everybody goes up when the median hits a certain range. It has, we have, we have now, we know so much more about it than we did 20 years ago and learning more all the time. And everything we learn is just so encouraging that this is such a high leverage tactic. I say to systems all the time, Look, if you want to change your math curriculum, that's fine, but it should not be your plan for fixing your learning loss because, you know, math curricula in general have weak effect sizes on student achievement. In fact, you might experience um, some learning loss when you implement a new curricula. Oftentimes systems do like that's probably part of what was so deadly to your children, Rebecca, that whole changing horses constantly. That's bad for kids. So. Um, what's protective in that environment is to install class-wide intervention. So I say, again, this is how I try to work with schools. They want to change their math curriculum. I go, that's a great idea. Get class-wide intervention in place first. And then there's a rubric to evaluate potential curricula. And there are, some are better than others. So try to pick a good one, but also get this underway because this class-wide intervention will be protective against learning loss. That's so interesting. I just wanted to ask, 
does, do you think that with infective, effective instructional practices that schools could take almost any math curricula and make it and have it have similar effects to your school? Well, I mean, so this is an interesting question. And we do actually, we, um, Ben Solomon, who's wonderful. I don't know if you've ever had him on your podcast, but um, he's great. I love him. We do a lot of work together. I've been on two of his students' dissertation committees in the last year. And um, one of them got dissertation of the year for SUNY. And um, it was really cool and fun to be part, you know, because I'm really not in that world very much anymore. Um, but anyway, um, what was I telling you about Ben Solomon? <laughs> I'm bragging about Ben, thinking about his wonderful students, losing track of what I was saying all together. <laughs> could you use any, could you Ben? Oh, any so we have a, we have a, pro a proposal that we submitted for a grant. It is a multi site, multi-state um, RCT. And one of the things that we included was we would, as a secondary question, is to evaluate the effects that we get for spring math, basically, but in certain, um, given certain core curricula. And we will sort of designate some or more sort of not discovery based and query based productive struggle and some are more amenable to you know explicit instruction and we hypothesize of course that we will see stronger spring math effects when it's installed and layered upon an effective core curriculum but to be honest with you the reason it's it we propose to study it is it's an it's i'm curious about it i'm not actually sure that that's what we will see because you know again most math curricula return a low effect on student achievement. Um, I'm curious about that. Now, your question was, can you take a math, basically any math curriculum and make it deliver an effect? And I guess I would say if you understand the science of how children learn and you think like I do, then yes, the answer is yes, because what you will do is you'll slice and dice it. You'll never present it in the way they've asked you to. You will not rely on the practice opportunities that are provided in the textbook or the workbook as the only practice opportunities that students will get. You will think about your lesson for the day and you will you'll have an instructional calendar where you have specified these are the learning outcomes over a 36 week um, instructional year, and you will have a system in place to assess whether or not children have mastered what you're teaching that week. Um, you will have daily lessons that attend very specifically to acquisition instruction, fluency building instruction, and generalization instruction in the same core instructional period. And by definition, that means you're targeting three different things because a kid cannot get acquisition support and generalization support for the same skill by definition. So acquisition is something that they're learning that is new. They don't know how to do it. Fluency building is something they learned maybe a week or two ago and they are accurate. They can do it independently. They know how it works, but it's hard. It takes a lot of bandwidth. It takes a lot of cognitive load. So therefore, they're going to miss application problems that have multiple steps because they're having to think too hard about how to get to each step of the correct procedural um, solution. And then generalization instruction is mastery level content. So that's maybe something that is even like you could think of it as a review skill. Those are great apply performance activities. So usually, you know, the math ed people have no love for me, most likely. And um, and I don't want to say the feelings mutual because I hold out hope. I still want to go on a date with them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like it could be a match made in heaven. I, I'm just an eternal optimist that way. But I often will say to them, you don't have to give up productive struggle. You just have to take it out of your acquisition part of your lesson and move it way over here to generalization. We call it generalization. You call it productive struggle. And I will say Robin and I had a paper just to get accepted at race. She might talk about it when she comes on um, remedial special education. It was a single subject study, which, by, again, let me just say out loud, is harder to do than a group randomized control trial. Um, we had about four kids in this study. And um, anyway, what we looked at were measures of anxiety, self-reported anxiety and skill performance. 
And we specifically took each kid and we gave them the correct aligned intervention that they needed according to the instructional hierarchy. And then we gave them a misaligned intervention according to their measured performance and the instructional hierarchy. So if a kid needed fluency, we gave them acquisition. If they needed acquisition, we gave them fluency. That was the misalignment. And then we gave them what they needed. And we, of course, all the procedural controls and whatever. And what we found for some of those students, um, we did find that that anxiety was higher in the condition in which they were getting the instruction that was not well aligned with their needs. So again, it's more evidence that it's not the case that kids just check the box, do or don't have math anxiety. It's more complicated than that. They have it could it could potentially even be very skill specific. Um, but we do find that it's most likely and, and it is something that you can fix. You control this as a teacher. It's more likely for some children to experience anxiety when they are being given instruction that's not well aligned with what they need. So if you take a kid who has never done multiplication, you're introducing it and you go, all right, we're going to let you mess around with this and figure this out. Um, you know, using the math you already know how to do, because that's really sometimes that's about as much guidance as they get. Isn't that a recipe for anxiety? It actually made me have the thought that if school practices were aligned with the science of learning and the science of math, you'd have a probably a hard time getting that study through an IRB because it seems like actually really <laughs> not very nice you know isn't it interesting like i think about that a lot too and even you know there's even getting your work published getting your work um like writing successful grant proposals i mean there's there's an appetite sometimes among funding agencies to sort of they bought into the idea of well what about um, productive struggle and what about inquiry based learning and like you almost have to dress your stuff up in this other stuff to get it get it through get it over the finish line and, and that takes a lot of um, I don't know chutzpah to not water your work down that way or dress it up differently it's not sometimes it's a practical thing you kind of have to because like as an academic you're evaluated on your number of publications and whether or not you get funded studies funded. But also at the end of the day, we really have to be about, you know, identifying the correct mechanisms of action. That's that's the goal. And to, you know, allow systematic replication so that we can be sure that these are the things. And then what I like to say to teachers is I don't care how you dress it up or what you call it. That's why I really do think, Rebecca, I absolutely could help any teacher take any curriculum, but what it might mean is we're almost not using the curriculum at all in some cases, right? I, I totally see that. And I see like, so my husband is an eighth grade math teacher and he laments that you know, none of them know their basic facts. And, and he's come home and said, I just totally switched up the lesson. We were supposed to spend you know, the whole class figuring out on our own the Pythagorean theorem. He's like, I just told it to them. <laughs> and, and then said, if you want to know how this works, like watch this video. And they, like, it was just, he said it was like the best you know, he's taught that same lesson year after year. And he was like, they actually got it. And I was like, yeah, because yeah, you use explicit instruction. And I love how you, you introduced me really to the instructional hierarchy. And I use that on really a daily basis. And I was thinking about how um, my husband was going to download a new computer game, right, and teach my children how to play this. And they were all going to play it together. And he was kind of pondering, like, I could just download it and we can figure it out and, and work through it. Or, you know, I could study up on it and then learn it myself and then teach it to them. And I was like, hmm, which one is, <laughs> is going to learn? You just throw them into it and have them play around with it. He chose to do that. And of course, they were like <laughs> screaming and shouting and oh, I'm dead. It was like a total disaster. I was like, see, you need to follow the instructional hierarchy, even when you can <laughs> children how to play video games. So there you are. It's hard to be married to, huh? <laughs> Nobody likes being married to an expert. <laughs> I mean, but you're right. You were right. Yeah. I feel like that that falls into um, some of the work that you're going to be at doing at NASP that with your presentation and with Ed Week and whatnot and kind of bringing that, again, like you said, it's it's learning in general. And, you know, there's 
better ways to memorize things. There's better ways to retain things and re yeah. and, and and following that structure of explicit instruction, fluency building, um, that that holds across things. So can you tell us a little bit about your NASCAR? Well, I mean, yeah. you know, part of what's happening in, over for me over the last several years is, you know, you can't sit on the sidelines. You have to. You know, it's funny because Matt Burns and I have had this conversation a lot. Like we look we look at each other and go. Oh my gosh, we are like some of the senior people in the field now. Like all, you know, everybody's retiring. I don't know if you guys are noticing that, but like all of these wonderful people, like we stood on their shoulders. They paved the way for us. You know, like think about like the Dave Tillies of the world and the George Batches of the world and Sandy Christensen and Jim Isildike and like people who just made things possible. And then the young career people like at us at the time, we could do all this great work. Well, you know, a lot of those folks have retired and, and the wars have just changed. They just changed names. They just changed jargon, but it's still these ongoing philosophical battles. And it's never comfortable to be in the middle of that. But I don't think I, me morally, it's, I can't sit on the sidelines with that. So I try to I try to contribute and it is uncomfortable sometimes, but like an, an example of that, of course, it's NASP. So NASP are our people and I'm always comfortable at NASP. It's like going home. It's the only conference I have consistently gone to every single year I've been in the field. The only year I missed is when I was having um, my daughter in 2007. But otherwise, I've been at NASP every year since the mid 90s and I I love it. And so um, I asked if we could have a session this year. And um, what we want to do, it's it's me and Matt Burns and Robin Cotting, my favorites, <laughs> some of my favorites. Um, we want to sort of take we want to make this case that stop thinking about it as MTSS and science of reading and science of math. But instead, there really is this underlying science of learning. And I, I think I would say I don't know if Matt would agree, because I will, you know, I've written a lot with him. And so I would say he, over the years, he influences me because he comes from a slightly more cognitive perspective than I do. And I come from a, maybe a slightly more behavioral perspective than he does, although we're more similar than we are different. But we stretch each other in that way. And so I hope Matt will talk about the science of reading. And um, I will talk about, in fact, I'm kind of excited about this. I, I taught my cat to ring a bell for food and, and I have some graphics that go and it just sort of explains how the science of instruction actually works in a very behavioral way. And then I use these videos with this cat. I mean, if you can teach a cat to do something, right, you can teach anybody to do anything because cats are not really trainable. They're not supposed to be. But he was totally trainable. And the thing that got him over the hump, which makes me just laugh even now, is modeling and a three-step prompt. And I laugh about that because go on Twitter and somebody, some teacher will be talking about how modeling is bad for kids. It is not. It is very effective. And it even works for your cats. So I'm going to use, a, it's a you know 10 second video of him showing how we trained him to ring this bell. And then I, I'm going to give examples in math and in reading. And even there's, I have a video where a teacher's doing a reading intervention with a child and I've marked on the video so you can see what are the active ingredients as they're happening during this episode because there really is a beautiful science to this when you don't understand the science it's too easy and this is not this is not my um commentary really bear wolf and risley in 1968 one of you know they sort of laid out the tenets of applied behavior analysis in that article which is a seminal article and one of the things that they said is if there is not a coherent science then it's too easy for a, or a technology to sort of just become a bag of tricks and you don't want anything like this notion of like building fluency to be uh, just a trick that you do. No, there's a reason for it. We don't always want to build fluency. It's not always appropriate to build fluency. But when it is appropriate, there's high quality fluency building activity. The goal of that, we, the, the purpose of that is not memorization. Memorization is often a natural side effect. I would say if you, when you become fluent, 
chances are you have you are now in a place that you have automatic recall and i'm not going to say automaticity because fluency has existed since bf skinner it has a real history has a real place in science and animal studies and human studies it's a real thing it means accuracy plus speed it is an indicator of the ease with which you are able to perform a learned skill it is um, reflective of your likelihood of retaining that skill down the road, being able to use it to solve more complex work. So fluency is a real construct. And um, so I'm going to use that word unapologetically. But like if you think of it as a trick and you say, oh, we're going to drill and kill until kids memorize, you don't understand fluency building. That's that's not really how the science works. Does that make sense? Yeah. And sometimes we'll have teachers, so we'll go in, you know, we're, we think a lot about implementation science, you know, and sometimes we'll go into classrooms and we will observe teachers in class-wide math interventions say things like, and they almost like do this. So I always do this when I say it, but they'll, they'll say to their students, memorize it. And I'm like, well, if you had a wand, a magic wand, a memorization wand, that would work. But since you don't, Actually, what you really want is a high dosage of opportunities to respond on the right level of task difficulty. And this is what it looks like, you know. I love it. I love it all. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah. And, and, and um, so the thing with Ed Week, too, is that separate from what, what is yeah, that? It's you, another, you know, it's another session. Um, my, my cat's name is Hank. He's becoming a little bit famous. I did a, I did a session. I did that session. We, we were doing, I went to North Dakota in the summer and um, for their MTSS conference. And um, do you know Stephanie Stolar? Do you know that name? Stolar? She, she's, she's one of us. She uh, worked with Acadians for a long time. She came out of Oregon. She's a school psychologist. She runs, um, she does reading professional development. She's a really important leader to me in the science of reading movement. She and I co-delivered the keynote and sort of, you know, in tandem, science of reading, science of math. It was super fun. And then in my follow-up session, I used my videos of, of Hank, the cat, learning to ring the bell and teaching people. And this is, this is the science of this. And this is how you lay it out in your classroom. And, um, and it was so well received. I thought, oh, okay, I'll do that again. So I did. I did something for Pennsylvania. And then that's what we pitched to NAS. And then we had an opportunity to do something for Ed Week because Spring Math approached me and said, my partners said, we would like to sponsor a session with Ed Week. And you can do that. And would you like to do that? You can present on anything you want, Amanda. What, what do you think the field needs to hear? And I said, well, can I ask my buddies to join me? And they said, yes. And so we're going to do that session again. You know, the other thing I guess I would be hot to talk about is implementation science, because, you know, we can never do enough work in that space. And I know like in my world right now, almost 99% of my effort is around implementation science, even like because we harvest data at the system level. So we pay attention, we know exactly which skills are difficult to master universally. And then that allows us to engineer solutions that teachers don't even know about, but they, but then it helps them to get a better result with their learners. So, and I love that. That's my favorite way to work with teachers is, you know, not to like go in and retrain. I mean, that's part of it, but it's better if you can implement these workarounds. So we know what's, we can change a decision rule. We can um, add what we did last year is for uh, subtraction and division inside spring math, we enabled a digital incremental rehearsal add-on. And it's only three minutes. You don't have to print anything. Kids chorally respond. There's a little video that teaches an unknown. And then there's an inter incremental rehearsal deck. Have you guys ever used incremental rehearsal? Okay, so you know, I mean, it's a very effective tactic and I, I'll give Matt Burns the credit for that. I, that's who I really got influenced by to try it and use it. And I've used it for 20 years. But, um, but I will say the hard part about incremental rehearsal is the order is so important. That's the mechanism of action. And it's too easy when you're using like a, a deck of cards to mix that up. 
So it was one of those things that like in our situation, it's perfect because if we present it digitally, it can't be messed up, right? We control that. Nobody has to print anything. It's not a replacement for class-wide intervention. It's a three minute add-on. We do it, we situate it inside our instructional sequences so that we are pre-teaching subtraction when we know it's coming up in grades three through six, because that's where it is sticky for our kids. Isn't that interesting? Second graders master it, no problem. Third grade and up, it's because teachers think it has been taught. And I can only imagine they're not facile at teaching subtraction as finding an unknown add -in. And same thing, isn't it interesting that it's division and subtraction that are sticky? Those are both skills, like division is finding an unknown factor, right? And subtraction is finding an unknown add -in. And those are the two things that are universally difficult and take like double the weeks to master other, sk this other skills in the uh, class-wide intervention sequence. So that's just an example. But we find things like this all the time that we can tweak that we don't actually have to go out and build a training. We don't have to try to create a new model or a new program or a new set of materials. We can simply modify things within the platform that will help teachers get a better result based on what we see in front of us. I love science. <laughs> it's, so I know, it's so fun. And you know, all of this makes so much sense. So, you know, in undergrad, I, I started in a rat lab and it was, so it was very, you know, um, you know, shocks and uh, water and reinforcement with water and um, all sorts of things. And, you know, it wasn't until later as a school psychologist, I mean, you use behavioral stuff, obviously, with behavior, with the kid that's throw in the chair and, and all that thing. But I didn't necessarily like see that connection in academics until later in my career that, you know, effective instruction is, you know, it's, it, it's a science. It's it's the same thing, yeah. Um, and just in the outcome that you're measuring is the academic skill that you're that you're targeting. You want to increase. You want to reinforce. You want to you know all those all those things of repetitions and. Um, so yeah, it's just super cool. I just love it. It's super cool. Like I remember one time in graduate school. Did you ever meet Joe Witt? Did y'all ever know Joe Witt? He was my major professor. Oh, just a brilliant man. One of the most kind people you'll ever meet. Truly brilliant. I don't feel like I use that word a lot, but I, he really is brilliant. Um, but I remember one time, you know, because we, we were very much a behavior analysis program and, and we were doing this functional analysis work, experimental functional analysis with kids in schools and classrooms. And, um, and I remember I was talking about noncompliance and Joe sat back and he goes, is noncompliance even a behavior? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that's so profound. <laughs> so we, we changed it. We did, we actually did a functional analysis of compliance and during instruction, it was super fun. We never published those data, but George Knoll was uh, one of my mentors too back then. And I remember doing some studies where we identified, you know, difficult and less preferred tasks and more preferred tasks in preschool classrooms. And then we would make access to the preferred task contingent on completing the non-preferred task and like certain intermixing arrangements and all these very cool studies that the, I, I grew up in that. Like it, it was not, we never thought of disruptive behavior as being any different than oral reading fluency because a behavior is a behavior is a behavior. It's just, do you want to apply the science to reduce its occurrence or do you want to apply the science to increase its occurrence? And even in, in uh, academics, so like errors, you want to decrease errors. And there are some great punishment strategies. To, is that a bad word now? It might be, but punishment strategies to decrease errors, like, you know, overcorrection is a great strategy. Like things that... Um, you know, you can do with your own children um, or even you could do this stuff with your teachers. With, you know, like I remember in grad school, speaking of George Knoll, you, you know, you would have we had this teacher who just liked to talk to us. So we would show up and she would catch us in the hallway and like 30 minutes la later, we're, we're late for our session. Like we got to move these kids through. We're collecting data. You know, it's a busy day. And so we were saying to George, oh, my gosh. We like her, but she's wearing us out. We can't get started because she wants to talk for like an hour. And he goes, oh, I tell you what, no, here's what you got to do. 
the next time she walks up to you, he's like, just, and he printed something, he handed it to us. And he's like, just give her this and say, I need you to fill this out and we'll talk about it tomorrow. It's a scatter plot. And it's, I, I, I've used that my whole entire life. I have used that um, with my friends, with my family, with my children. It's the George Knoll effect. It's the George Knoll treatment. If you want to reduce the occurrence of a behavior, make it a little more difficult right? You want to access and have a conversation outside of the classroom. That's no problem. Do this first. Because guess what? They're not going to do it. And then they're not going to come out and talk to you tomorrow because <laughs> they didn't do it. So behavioral treatments are very effective. They're very effective, like from the front door of the school, all the way to the oral reading fluency with the child, to the math problems. It's all the same. And I feel like so often we get, and, and like you said, different approaches, cognitive and behavioral stuff, but but people are so fascinated by like the neuro, like in the brain and what's going on. And to me, it's kind of like, does it really matter? Like, is it I working is it effective or not? Are they right learning now? to read? <laughs> I don't even care. Like, I really can't get that excited about it. I'm not that interested in it. I know enough because I need to know enough and, uh, and appreciate and admire the people who do care about that work. And maybe someday it really is going to open new windows into our understanding. And I, I am like, I love Dan Ansari's work, for example, in math, and he's definitely cognitive. And um, I love that work, but it's not the kind of work I want to do for sure. I'm just more, I think I'm more practical in the classroom um, somebody called me a hyphen one time, like, you know, um, research, pra research practitioner, you know, they said I'm the hyphen. <laughs> I feel that way because I'm not really interested in doing research that really is not in a pretty messy context, which is the real world, you know. Oh my and I, always, I always felt like, really, are we really going to put kids in MRIs to figure out who needs reading intervention? You know, also at the end of the day, you know, the, the sensitivity that they're aiming for, sensitivity and specificity is never better than what Dibbles would have given you or Acadians now, you know, would have given you. So it's hard to, to me to think, why, why would we justify that that layer of um, intensive surveillance, expensive surveillance, right? And plus, like, what is that? That's hard on a kid to have to go through that process. So, yeah. I'm looking at the time and I'm like, oh, it goes by way too fast. And I just like, <laughs> like I said, so many other things fast. on the past. But um, yeah, so um, I'm looking for last minute comments and whatnot. Um, and people are just, you know, saying, uh, you know, thank you for, you know, I, I feel like it was a, a good discussion and whatnot. Eric, Rebecca, um, uh, Amanda, any other last, last words? Um, or thoughts or questions before we stop to wrap up because we're beyond our time. And I know that Rebecca has a busy schedule and she likes to get to bed on time. <laughs> yeah, and you're Eastern. Oh, you're Eastern time too. Y'all are all Eastern except for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So are you guys going to NASP in New Orleans this year? Yes. Yes. Good. You have to. Sure. You're not sure? I know, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. What's the matter with you? But we'll see. I have to then get out of my classes and make up work. I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I'm presenting, so I'll be there. What are you presenting on? Uh, uh, school refusal behavior, effective interventions and treatment. Cool. Assessment Very intervention. Cool. Well, yeah. hey, say hello. Let's be sure. Yes, we'll absolutely. Be, yeah. We'll talk about you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have uh, some great. serious uh, fear of missing out, the FOMO. So now I feel like, yeah, I'm going to have to, I have to, I'm going to drag you, Rebecca. If I'm going, I'm dragging you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm easily just, dragged because I do. Proud of, I'm proud of NASP for focusing on, um, you know, academic interventions. It's so important for kids. They, they are in school to learn and come out of school with the benefit, the protective benefit of proficiency in reading and math. And writing. That's it. It's an easy, if you think about it, it gets real simple. We have to prioritize that.
And everything else we do, like, you know, you got to get them to school for them to learn to read, right, Eric? So school refusal becomes yeah. something we have to work on, exactly. right? I mean, all the rest of it, we work around it, but it's because our goal is we want everybody to get the benefit of their their education. Yeah. What what sorry. quick quick question? And I'm I'm sorry, Rebecca. I just can't I can't control myself. But um, I was just thinking about um, a parallel like with the science of reading. Um, you know, Lucy Calkins like became kind of this. <laughs> lightning rod for people kind of really calling her out and yeah. about, and a lot of kind of animosity and eventually like the that whole thing dissolving and kind of restructuring and whatever is going to happen with that um do you feel like and you're always very careful about you never name names as far as who in in the math world is maybe saying things that are problematic um you call out ideas i've not seen you you know call out people do you feel like you know does something like what with Lucy have to happen in math? Do people need to be called out eventually? Or is that going to be at this stage in the game more problematic and cause more? No, she's going to get called out. And, and the problem is, okay, people try to do it nicely with Lucy Calkins. And can you imagine for decades? All right. The problem was the level of hubris, the consistent disregard for any demonstrated efficacy that just eventually that will get you. you. You see what I'm saying? And in the math world, there is, there is, a, there is a person who is, you know, I say all the time, because you know, a decade ago, 15 years ago, when I would give a presentation, people would come up and say, what about Joe Bowler's research? I'll just say her name. And I, I remember the first time I heard her name, I'm like, that's funny. I know the literature. I've never heard of this person. And then I began to go and look, all right? Um, and what I discovered was, and, and this is what I began to say to people when they would come up and say, what about Joe Bowler's research? I would say, well, you know, respectfully, she's not really a researcher. That's not, I wouldn't call her a researcher. I would call her a very influential thought leader for what it's worth. She is a very influential thought leader and typically her pieces are interpreting other people's research or her actual research pieces I find very problematic as a former, you know, and current uh, very frequent reviewer, but as a former editor and associate editor for um, books and journals and, the, you know, this evidence that we all respect and want to promote high quality work, um, I would not have published that work at all. No way would I have said yes to some of those research studies that are held forth to support her claims and they are, you know, her work. But I saw her sort of just get um, destroyed, you know, in social media. And for like one second, I was like, oh, good. Somebody's finally saying something. And then I thought, oh, it went really far, really fast. Do we really have to be this ugly and this vicious? Do we really have to tear people apart? But, but I guess it depends because like I do know, People did try to address it with Lucy Calkins' influence forever. Same thing with, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Ken Goodman in um, Arizona, the whole language guy. And he's like in his 90s giving an interview saying, I still stand by what I said. And I actually kind of felt sorry for him because nobody should have inter interviewed somebody who's in their 90s because who knows if he's even really still feeling qualified to make those statements, but he did make those statements. So the level of hubris, I do often say to myself, Amanda, do not ever get lost in that. You know, always have a healthy appreciation that what you are doing when it is no longer working, if it is found not to work, if you discover a different way, change it change it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's called, that's how science progresses. That's how we should all work. Um, so no, I was not actually delighted to see her rip to shreds. I, I thought it got real ugly real fast. But on the other hand, I think that the California math framework was, is, is detrimental. I think the rest of us will be fighting against that forever because what happens is when it's put in a document like that, people think it's codified, people think it's real, and it's too much intellectual work to take it apart. So they're not going to necessarily do that. 
Um, so I, it's, it's a tough, that is a tough thing to solve. I don't know that I've really figured out the answer, but I am, I guess, brave enough now to say her name out loud and say, yeah, I mean, she's sort of that equivalent in the math world and she has enjoyed an awful lot of influence. And I have not really seen her adjust her position in response to the challenges that have been leveled, you know, at her commentary from people who are very qualified and who had really good evidence to back up their scientific claims. And I'll say like my own interaction with this guy on Twitter, I can't remember his name. I never remember the name of people I don't, I'm not impressed by. And um, anyway, it was it, his, his I, I thought his tone was unprofessional, but also by the way, his reaction to me was um, to send me to, you know, evidence. Cause I said, legit, send me the, send me, I will, I will actually read it. He said, well, I can't read anything behind a paywall. And I said, well, if that's true, you're not reading the literature, number one. And oh, by the way, he sent me to a blog. That was his evidence. It was a blog. That's not evidence. That is not, <laughs> no, just cause it's written somewhere does not make it equal to a high quality journal article published in a really high quality journal. And just cause it's a journal article doesn't mean it's an equivalent either. Right? So it's, it's messy and it's hard for people. Like how is a parent supposed to know the difference between, Oh wait, that's a journal that it's really, and this is a journal that you pay to get into. Right. How, how can they know the difference? So, you know, we tell people go to go to NCII, go to intensiveintervention.org, go to What Works Clearinghouse, go to these other vetting sources and let them do that work for you. Yeah. So I said her name. Was that the one? Is that who you wanted me to say? That was who I was thinking about. I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't mean to like pressure you into it. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, as Mark Shin says, you know, you're going to stand in the bully pulpit, people going to come after you. And it happens. But it's again, it's like I, I personally made a decision with the science of math. I can't really sit on the sidelines anymore. There's, you know, if the work is going to take root and actually influence kids, then you, you have to be willing to it would take a few hits. People are going to take some swings. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a good point about, you know, journals and not journals and quality within journals and whatnot. Cause a lot of the things that people they want to push back, yeah, you get white papers, you get all sorts of things that mm -hmm. maybe are coming from dubious places or, or advocacy groups that have, <laughs> right. um, yeah, that aren't maybe unbiased or, yeah, and I want to say too, I have being from Teachers College originally, Columbia, where Lucy Calkins is from. I feel so much embarrassment on behalf of the entire community of Teachers College. I feel as though not only are the people responsible for what they put out, but there is a community that either look the other way or, you know, just push things forward. And why, Rebecca? How did that happen? Right. And so right? I, I think there's some sort of collective responsibility that we all I agree with you. There were no doubt other contingencies. And this is something, too, I think about a lot because I have a commercial product now. So I have a conflict. I will always have a conflict the rest of my life, even if I'm not affiliated with Spring Math. I, I, I will always have that conflict. So. We all have conflicts. People who say they don't have conflicts really have conflicts. We all do. Even if you are somebody who only does academic work, guess what? You have a conflict because if you write a book or you have a grant proposal, you know, funded, you are vested in that thing, your model, you're vested in that being successful. It's your next speaking gig. It's your next uh, faculty appointment. We all have contingencies that influence our behavior. So all we can try to do is be as transparent and honest about that as possible. And I'm always like, I'm really proud of our scrappy little team. We're in year eight, growing 50% per year. We retain better than 85% of kids year over year. That's huge in this space. I think we do it because we're so focused on implementation. I mean, our whole team is, but I say to my team all the time, when we are not used correctly, that is not, that is feedback to us that we need to do a better job. 
And when we find that something is not working, we will change it. So like we get asked all the time, you know, do you want to, Harvard asked us this week, there's a group there, they want to partner on a research project. And it's easy for us to say yes to that, because what we say is we want to do high quality research. We never want to do a study that is like the conclusion is spring math works. That's not interesting. That doesn't advance science. So we we do research that advances science. And as a result, like some lady in some state this a couple of weeks ago said, there's no spring math studies. Can you imagine? <laughs> We're like, well, actually, there's like a lot, not just mine, but lots of people. It's just we never use the word spring math in the study because that's not the point. But um, but my point is, um, you know, we all have to be willing. And I tell my team this, if we discover that something doesn't work well. We will change it. That's that's what we want people to be able to say. Why, why is that a problem? Why should people ever say, I have to defend this thing I made up and tried in 1970, and now it's 2000, and I know it doesn't work, but I can't say that out loud? Come on. What's the point? Yeah. Great discussion. Uh, sorry, Rebecca, we're almost 20 minutes over. Um, <laughs> thank you for being flexible. Uh, Dr. Bender Hayden, thank you for being generous with your time. Um, yes. This is awesome. We love having you. So fun. I love seeing you guys. Thank you. Great to see you too. Great Have to a good see one, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night, Bye, everyone. Everybody.